Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Redbird Educator Series. I'm Lara Hansfield. I am an affiliate faculty member at Illinois State University with the Mary and Jean Borg Center for Reading and Literacy. Um, and my areas of interest are elementary literacy and bilingual education. And I'm thrilled to be hosting this webinar. Thank you for being here. We are excited to have Dr. Christy Angleton from the School of Teaching and Learning here with us today to share her expertise in a presentation titled Learning to Linger, what picture book design can teach teachers about lingering in texts with children. Our hour together today will begin with an introduction of the featured speaker, Dr. Christy Angleton. Her presentation will last about 45 to 50 minutes. During the presentation, we would encourage you to use the Zoom chat feature to post comments and to interact with one another. However, if you have specific questions for Dr. Angleton, please use the Q&A feature. Um, I will be monitoring that as we go, and I will be rejoining you for um, Q&A. Um, so let's get started. Dr. Christy Angleton is an assistant professor of early childhood literacy in the School of Teaching and Learning at Illinois State University. A former preschool teacher, her research focuses on young children's understanding and performance of gender, engaging in critical literacies with children and pre-service teachers, and diverse children's literature as a vehicle for social justice. Her most recent projects involve analyzing children's artistic responses to picture book text as a form of meaning making and a critical content analysis of patriotic symbols in picture books, which sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, welcome, Dr. Angleton. Thank you, Laura, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, so we're going to talk about picture book design, and my hope is that um, you all have a book or two that you might be able to look at um, while we go through these design features. Um, if you don't, you can just kind of hang in there with us because um, I have lots of examples on the slide. Um, so as Laura mentioned, um, anytime that you have questions, you can pop those into that Q&A feature. And then um, I will kind of pause midway through um, to, to make sure that I haven't missed anything because let's be very real, I cannot do all of these things, right? The multitasking is not there. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing that um, I wanna make sure that we talk about is the, um, the, the word picture book. The term picture book refers to a format, not a genre, okay? So oftentimes um, those get conflated and people will say, oh, mysteries, histories, biographies, picture books. Um, but for any of us that have spent any time at all with picture books, we know that they can be all of those things, right? So we're talking specifically about the, the format this evening, okay? All right, so the first thing I'd like you to do is if you brought a book along with you this evening, I want you to take a look at it. So we're gonna look at the books um, sort of piece by piece. We're just gonna kind of parse the whole thing apart from the front to the back. So the first thing I want you to notice is the shape of the book and also the orientation. Um, is it vertical? Is it horizontal? So here's an example of a vertical text. This one's horizontal. Most often we see rectangular, either vertical or, or horizontal rectangles for picture books, but sometimes we'll get something else like a square. And then other times we even have books that are shaped like the thing they're about. So oftentimes we see this with board books for very, very small kiddos. Um, so the example on the left, um, you can see where the top of the birdhouse is cut out. And then Maisie's train is shaped like a train car. So the next thing for you to notice is the cover of the book, okay? So try to get a sense of what the book is about. What genre do you think it might be based on its appearance? Um, do we have something historical, um, contemporary family, animal fantasy as some examples? So here we have something that's historical. Here's a contemporary family. 
And here's an animal fantasy because that little chicken down there, Peggy, she's gonna go off into the big city and have all kinds of adventures. And at this point, I'm literally asking you to judge a book by its cover. So it's not very often that we do that. So the next thing for you to notice, oh, here's some more examples. <laughs> so here's something that's humorous, something that's a little bit more serious. So oftentimes when we look at the cover of the book, we can get a sense of what it's about. And when we invite kids to offer their theories about what texts are about, then that gets them into the book before we've even opened the front cover. So the front cover information shows up in lots of different ways. Um, sometimes we get the title at the top, sometimes we get the author and illustrator, but the big information that's always on the cover is that title, our author, and our illustrator. Sometimes we get the author and we've got a combo author and illustrator here. So as you're looking at the cover of your book, I want you to also see if you notice any unusual features because sometimes we get a little bonus content on the front. For example, oftentimes books will have these um, gold or silver circles on them that indicate that this book is an award winner. So um, oftentimes if you see those, those features on the text, then you know that that book has won an award from some organization or another. This is a picture book biography of Helen Keller and you'll notice across the top that there is um, braille actually, the, the title of the book is in braille. Um, and when you touch it, it's raised like braille. So sometimes there are different features um, that go above and beyond the, um, the author, illustrator and title information. Once in a while, you'll get a book cover that doesn't have any of that information. So here's an example of a book where we just have an illustration. And in this case, lots of very, very deserving awards. And it's not until you turn it over to the back cover that you get that information. So the title, the subtitle, and the author and illustrator. Okay, if you have a hardcover book, I'd like you to lay it out face down so that you can see the full, um, the full front and back cover laid out. So open it to a flat position and you can usually see one of two things. You either see um, what they call a, a full poster illustration, such as this one, where the illustration goes from the front, it's on the front, and then it wraps around to the back of the book as well. Sometimes there's a different illustration on the back, so it hangs with the, the front, um, but it's slightly different. So here's an example of that one. Sometimes when there is a full poster like this, there will be a stripe of color down the spine so that it makes it easier for um, people to read it when it's on the shelf. All right, you can flip that back over to the front or maybe even the back and you can look for advertising and or promotion. So oftentimes books like to give themselves little pats on the back. <laughs> so there's some, um, promotion or advertising, and particularly if the book is, um, if, if the author and or the illustrator have another book in that series or even just other books that they've written, oftentimes you'll see things like that on the back. So, um, you know, it's kind of the publisher's way of saying, hey, you spent a little bit of cash on this book, don't you want the rest of them, right? And then here's another example of some um, promotion or advertising that's on the inside flap. Anytime there are starred reviews or really, um, you know, the book has gained a lot of popularity, you'll see those features. So 
So the next thing for us to is explore is if you have a hardcover text, um, you can look at the dust jacket. So the dust jacket is literally what it sounds like. It's a paper or plastic cover that goes over the outside and it's supposed to help um, prevent some of the wear and tear on the cover of the book. Um, I always get asked by my students when we do this work together, like, are, is it really doing that much to save the book? And maybe it's hearkening to an older time. Um, but the great thing about the design jacket is that oftentimes, um, you get a little bit of a bonus art sometimes. So when you're finished reading, it's interesting to remove that dust jacket and see um, if you've got a different picture, um, if there's an illustration, if it's something adapted. So here's an example of a book that when you pull up the dust jacket, the cover is the same right underneath. But for this book, Small World, we have the dust jacket on the left and the cover of the book on the right. This is an illustration that does show up in the text. And often if you have um, a cover that looks different than your dust jacket, it's usually going to be um, a picture from the inside of the book. Once in a while, you'll find one that um, is completely original, which that's really exciting because it's like you get a bonus illustration. So here are a few more examples of some dust jackets that look different from the cover of the book. So on the left, we have the dust jacket for Juliana is a mermaid and on the right, we have the front cover art. And that's also a spread in the book. Barcodes are really, really fun. It's something really fun to look at. It's something really fun to point out to children um, when you're reading in a classroom. Um, it's usually located on the back of the book. Um, sometimes it's in the center at the bottom. Sometimes it's off to one side, but it's really fun to take a peek and see if it is um, you know, incorporated into the design of the text. So here are just a few of my favorites. So it's really fun to show kids on just one text what you see if they're incorporated into the design and then they will always, always, always tell you every single time that they see one that's interesting. And sometimes they get a little offended if it's not interesting. <laughs> so here are a couple more examples. They're just clever and interesting. And if they are incorporated in, they usually are pretty funny. Um, and it's not just picture books that do this. Um, if any of you drink Coffee Mate brand coffee creamer, turn it over tomorrow and look at that barcode and you might be surprised with what you see. I love looking at barcodes because I oftentimes think that they're really, um, kind of adult humor, like it's kind of funny for the adults, but sometimes I think the kids are really in mind. So my all time favorite barcode um, is on the back of a book called I'm the Biggest Thing in the Ocean. And on that book, um, in that book, we have this very um, sort of sassy blue squid swimming his way through the ocean and talking about all the things he's bigger than. So I'm bigger than these fish, I'm bigger than these jellyfish, I'm bigger than these clams. And then near the end of the book, he actually gets swallowed by a rather large, very, very large um, whale. And when he's inside the whale, he looks around and he says, I'm the biggest thing in this whale. And what's really lovely is when you turn the book over, he's on the back bragging that he's bigger than this barcode. So I love the barcode thing and it's really a nice feature to show kids and when, um, you know, if you do any kind of book studies or any bookmaking with your students, it's fun to see how they incorporate those in as well. So the next feature is the spine. It's pretty straightforward. You get a lot of the same information that you get on the cover. So you get the author illustrator, excuse me, the title, and then you also get the publishing house as well. Okay. So if you've ever noticed, 
at the bookstore that sometimes you have to go through the shelves and you have to look across spines, but then there are other books that are facing outward, right? So oftentimes you'll see these small collections of books that are facing outward. And if you've ever wondered why those books are facing outward, it's because the publishers spend a ton of cash to get their books facing outward because you're far more likely to pick up engage with and then buy a book that you can see the cover rather than having to, you know, kind of squint and look at titles on um, a shelf when they're stacked up in this way. But for people who are thinking through, there are combinations on the, um, on the spine. Some are really legible. The color combinations are effective. They kind of pop out and you can see them but some are a little less so. Sometimes um, the color combinations are ineffective. So oftentimes um, if you see, you know, red or green over blue or black, it's kind of hard to see. I especially find that top one there really difficult to see with that black font over that pink and purple um, spine. And the next feature is called a blind or a die stamp. These are pretty rare. Um, we don't see them very much. I think it's something that used to be um, more of a, a staple in book design, but it seems not to be the case. So if you have a hardcover book, you can lift up that, um, that dust jacket and just kind of run your hand across the front of the book um, and see if you feel any kind of indenting or even a little bit of a raised surface. So if you have something that's raised or that's pushed down that you can only kind of see if you hold it at the right angle or you can feel with your hands, that's called a blind stamp. So those stamps are in there and they usually have something to do with the design of the text. And then you also see sometimes what's called a die stamp. So the stamp is in and then it's been filled in usually with sort of a metallic, um, paint or, or printing of some kind, um, and that's called a die stamp. So you can see that one without having to turn, turn the book in any kind of way. So while we're looking at the title or at the cover, um, if you have a book that doesn't have this, any art on the front, it's just a plain color, this is when you're most likely to see a blind stamp or a die stamp. My second favorite feature of books um, are the end papers. So these are the pages that literally at the beginning and end of the book are meant to hold the cover onto the pages of the book. So when you have um, when you have a hardcover book, you know when you open up that front cover, you'll often have a few blank pages, um, or sometimes you'll get decorative end papers. So sometimes they just kind of hang with the, the, you know, sort of the aesthetic of the text um, or, or the design of the book or the illustrations, um, but sometimes they do other things. Um, and so here are a couple examples that are just sort of in the same aesthetic. But then sometimes we have front end papers that look one way. And then we read through the book and we see what happens and we get to the end of the story and the back end papers look different. So often this will tell you sort of what happens in the story. You know, you have kind of a preview and then sort of these nice um, bookends, if you will, of the front and back of the book. Many authors and illustrators will use um, light at the front and back of the text um, for the end pages. So this is from the book, Thank You, Amu. And the book starts in the morning, it's daytime. And then at the end of the book, it's nighttime. So you can see in that first picture, the colors are really bright, they're really popping. And then at the end of the book, everything's kind of muted and shadow because it's night at the end of the text, at the end of the story. Sometimes it's fun to see if you have the same end papers on the front and the back, or if they're different. Sometimes they're totally different. Um, 
and you kind of don't know why. And then as you dig in, you might find some answers. I really like using end papers to get kids to think about what the story might be about. So, you know, if you're used to doing like a picture walk or just talking through text before you read it with kids, it's really fun to show them not just the cover and ask for their predictions or their theories, but also those front end papers. What might be going on? What do you think is going to happen? And then when you flip them to the back and they're completely different, kids have lots of ideas about what that might mean. So along with the end papers, we have the flaps. And the flaps are the things that literally keep that, um, keep that dust jacket on the hardcover of the book. So they're the things that fold over and keep that dust jacket in place. So sometimes the, the flap kind of covers up some of the end papers. Um, and so you have to move it back in order to see it. Um, sometimes it doesn't really matter, you know, in this case, we pull the flap back and we have a continuation of the, of the illustration on those end papers, but it's not really like we're missing a whole lot. But in this same book, this is Maddie's fridge in the back flap, and you'll notice it was daytime in the front and now it's nighttime in the back. And you'll notice that if you don't flip up the flap, you miss Sophia peeking out of her apartment window there. So the dust jacket is fun. It's a really nice thing to have and it really does kind of prevent some of that damage to the outside of your book. Um, but it also sometimes can kind of get in the way. This is especially true when you get books from the library, like the public library, because they really reinforce those. They cover them in plastic and they, they make sure that those are attached so that they do that job. And so sometimes you have to really be kind of sneaky and peek under to make sure um, that you're not missing anything on those back end papers. Any questions up to this point? I know I'm going so much information your way, but I hope that you're able to um, look at your book as well. Christy, we don't have any questions in the Q&A yet. It's possible that some will come in and I would just remind everyone and encourage you to post any, any questions that you have for Dr. Angleton. We did have one question in the chat that's um, um, wondering, many people have been trying to quickly write down the titles of every single oh. present. <laughs> Is it possible for attendees to get um, an, a list of the text that you have included? Yes, I would very, very happily send that along. Um, I'm also in Goodreads and I have an entire shelf that's just called book design. So if you're on Goodreads, you can find me on there and, and they're all highlighted there as well, but I'm happy to send out a list. Great, thank you. Yeah. So it doesn't look like we have any questions in the Q&A now. So why don't you continue going and I will be monitoring that Q&A for everyone. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so now that we've kind of looked at all of the parts of the outside of the book, it's time for us to move to the inside of the book. So when you open up the front cover and you turn past the, um, the, the end papers, sometimes um, you'll get what's called a half title page. So all of that stuff that's in the front um, is called front matter or preliminaries. Sometimes, whoops, Sometimes you'll get a half title page where it's just the title, nothing else. So no author or il illustrator information, um, no information about the publisher, um, but sometimes there is um, an illustration that goes with that. Usually a half title page is before a full title page, but not always. So when we look at the title page, when we get past that front matter, oftentimes you have one of two things. You have one continuous picture. So the picture goes across an entire spread and you've got author and illustrator, title information, um, publisher information. But sometimes you have just two different pictures. They hang together, right? They're often from the story, um, but they are, um, Two, two different ones there. So sometimes you get a book like Night Tree by Eve Bunting. So let me tell you a little story about this text. 
The first time I ever read it, I was speeding through. I wasn't lingering and I skipped over the title page. And this book tells the story of a family who load up a truck on Christmas Eve. They go out into the forest and they decorate um, a pine tree with, um, you know, popcorn and peanut butter and, and treats for the animals. And then they sit and they wait and they see the animals come. And then they pack everything else up and they go home. It's really, really beautiful. And the first time I read it, I thought, oh, well, maybe they, um, you know, don't have the means to have, um, you know, a traditional Christmas tree, or maybe this is their tradition because they can't afford to do presents or something of that nature. And so I had a very specific reading of this text in my mind. But then the next time I read it, I lingered and I looked closely at the title page. And you can see in the background, they're in front of a house that's decorated and there's a fully decorated Christmas tree in the front window. So it completely changed the way that I read the text. So it's really important not to skip over some of that stuff, especially when you're reading with kids because it can totally change the entire meaning of the text. Um, when I read it a second time, having this new information, it was a completely different story for me. And so um, I think that those that information, um, even if it's illustrated information, is often really important and kind of gets the ball rolling for the rest of the story. Okay. All right, so copyright notice is another fun thing to look for. It's usually located in the preliminaries. It's usually at the front. Um, it's becoming more of a trend in publishing to be in the back of picture books. I don't know if they're just trying to get kids into the text really fast, um, but, um, but wherever you find it, it's interesting to look and see. It'll tell you all kinds of stuff, when it was published, by whom it was published. Um, you know, it tells you all the boilerplate stuff like, all rights reserved, you know, don't copy this without permission. And it will also indicate what edition it is. So if it's been, um, if it's had multiple printings, you know, if it's a book that's been around forever, you're going to see much higher numbers um, than in um, newer books. Sometimes it's just kind of squished down at the bottom of a page. And in this case, in the, in the example on the right, you have just these little poodles from, from the story that are gazing up at that to draw your attention. Sometimes the book designer or the illustrator or the author get really clever and they kind of incorporate um, the, the publishing information into the design of the book. So this is from a story called Tidy and you can see Pete there, Pete the Badger spends the entire book vacuuming up everything in the forest. And I do mean everything because he wants everything to be neat and tidy. And so when you turn to the back and you find the publishing information, he's even trying to clean that up with his little vacuum cleaner. So you can see that he's um, vacuuming up that information to get that page tidy. Oftentimes with the, um, the copyright information, you'll get information about how the illustrations were done. And sometimes that also will um, include the typeface. So what kind of text or type was used. Um, sometimes it is in its own space um, as a note. So this is an example from Thunderboy Jr. Um, in which the illustrator, Juju Morales, um, tore down the remains of an antique house um, down the, the street from where her studio was located. And so when the roof fell and the walls came down, she picked out the wood and the clay bricks and she scanned those and used their colors and textures to digitally paint the illustrations. Wow, right? So, I mean, so interesting. Sometimes you'll get a specific note like this one at the top um, about this book. The collages for this book were created with acrylic paint, china markers, pastel, pattern paper, um, and old paper clippings. 
when you do book studies with children, and then sometimes um, when I taught kindergarten, I did a lot of book studies with kids and we would do author illustrator stories and then kids would write their own stories, um, you know, in the style of that illustrator. And so we would try to make sure that we had all the same materials. So these, um, these notes are really helpful and they give you a lot of information. Sometimes they're like baked into the, um, the publishing information. So you can see I have a circle there um, where it talks about the type. Um, the text for the book is set in Hank BT and the illustrations are rendered using linoleum block prints, pencil and Photoshop. You can also see that there's a person who's responsible for designing these books. So that was not a, an option. That wasn't something that, you know, no book designers came to my career days at my high school, because if they did, we might not be having this conversation right now, because what a cool job that would be, right? Acknowledgements and dedication are another thing that's really fun to look at and notice and point out to kids. So here are just a couple of examples of ways that different authors um, and illustrators dedicate books. Um, I had a student when I taught kindergarten who had a little sister named Gretchen, and we actually found two books by completely different authors um, that were dedicated for Gretchen, and she thought they were for her sister, and she was a little salty that no famous authors had ever um, acknowledged a book to her, or dedicated a book to her. Um, acknowledgements tend to be in the back matter and you tend to see them a lot um, in nonfiction texts because, um, you know, there's a lot of research and a lot of archive work that has to happen. Um, and so oftentimes authors and illustrators will, um, you know, give a shout out to the archivists, the librarians, the scholars that helped them, um, that helped them get the information for their books. Okay, so let's talk about paper. So you might be thinking to yourself like, okay, paper is paper is paper, right? But in the world of picture books, this is just not true. Um, oftentimes, um, you'll see one of two um, types of paper. So you'll see what's called glossy, which is, um, you can notice if you tilt your book up to a light and you have a reflection, that's how you can tell it's glossy, okay? So here are some examples of gloss. And you can see in that middle picture, um, the, the glare from the light when I was taking the photo. So generally glossy papers are good for deep, rich colors, especially black and dark blue. And then matte, on the other hand, matte's a lot easier on the eyes. It's just not as good with color. So the colors are a little bit more muted. Um, they're not quite as rich. They're not popping quite as much. Um, and matte paper has that really papery feel. So when you turn the pages, it, it feels, um, you know, sort of pulpy and papery, whereas a glossy is, you know, slick and shiny closer to what you would um, notice if you turn like a magazine page. Sometimes we get books that have paper that's something completely unexpected. So here are a couple of examples. On the left, we have the book, Not a Box. So Not a Box is designed to look like a cardboard box, which is really interesting. Um, and as you page through it, you kind of get that feel. The pages are really heavy. Um, they don't feel like regular um, you know, book pages. And then this page on the right, um, this is from, Oh shoot, I'm blanking on what book this is, but you can see that this is upcycled cardboard. So the author illustrator took real cardboard, drew the, uh, the illustrations and the um, text on them, and then that was how they submitted the book. And you can see when you look at it that it's very much used cardboard. All right. So now I'd like you to page through your book if you haven't already done that and pay special attention to the text because there's lots of stuff going on that you might not notice. Um, it's really interesting, especially with kids who are emerging into reading, um, they notice every single difference. So when you think about things like font, um, you know, I can think off the top of my head, like 
five different ways to create a, a lowercase a. And they'll notice that, right? Because they're learning those letters and they're starting to notice those things. And so they really key into things like font. And so it's a really nice opportunity to talk about different fonts and how different letters are um, you know, shaped or formed differently, but they still do the same job in the text. So sometimes we have um, a combination of text fonts, display fonts, all kinds of different things going on. So on the left, this is an example of a display font. So it doesn't look like something that you could um, you know, recreate in Microsoft Word. But then on the right, that's an example of what's called a text font. And so to me, it looks like Times New Roman, right? So it's pretty straightforward. So usually texts have one or the other, but sometimes you get a combination. So here's an example of a display font that says Esperanza, and then your text font is the rest of the paragraph. <clears throat> and then sometimes you get an author illustrator like Oliver Jeffers, who hand writes every, all the text in his books. Um, something I think is really funny about him is that people have offered him like thousands of dollars to make his handwriting into a font because people love it. Um, and he keeps saying no, <laughs> um, because he says every time he writes, it's different. It's not consistent. And so um, he can't really make it into a font um, because it's never the same twice. Um, but maybe he can turn away cash better than some of us. So, so that text as a font eludes us. So sometimes font is used in a really interesting way. Um, sometimes it's big, little, or in this case, um, it kind of shows some of the action of the story in the way that the font is used. Um, these are both illustrations from Lauren Child and she is the queen of using texts in a really um, unique, strange, interesting ways to kind of make a point or to sort of um, go along with whatever's happening in the story. Font is also, or the text is also, um, it's interesting to look at the first letter, of the first word of the text. So sometimes you get what is called an initial letter that looks slightly different um, than the rest of the text. So I always thought of initial letters as something that you see in chapter books, because usually the first letter in a new chapter is maybe bigger or in a fancier font or something different, but many picture books do this as, as well. All right. So as you're paging through your book, you might notice the way that the text and illustrations are laid out. So sometimes you get the text that's pretty much the same on every page. So you kind of know where to look for it. It's pretty consistent in terms of the size, the color, but sometimes there are slight variations and sometimes you'll have spreads with no text at all. And sometimes every page looks different. So this is from Dreamers by Juji Morales. And on that very left-hand page, the, the text is on the backpack, on that green backpack. And then we've got text at the top. We've got um, sort of a flag or a banner of sorts that the, um, that the bird is flying on the bottom of the page. And then we've got a, a combination of text and display fonts on that right hand spread. So some books, they are different on every spread and it is fun to point out the differences to kids. And I used to ask kids, why? Why do you think that the, you know, the book designer or the author or the illustrator made these different? Why is the text different? And so then they create theories and, and they think about, um, why those decisions are made and how that those decisions support the text. So this is an example 
of what is called formal. So when you have the text on one side and the illustration on the other, and the text is on you know, a white page, um, this is called formal. And this really helps um, you know, heighten your senses um, in books that have sort of a surreal um, vibe to them. Like think about Chris Van Allsburg, if you're familiar with his books, a lot of his books are like this. Or in the case of this text, something, um, there, there's strong emotion happening in the book right now. And so it makes this really formal sort of disconnected feeling. So another thing that's fun to look for are borders and boxes. So this is when um, a traditional picture book illustration kind of acts a little bit like a comic or a graphic novel. So you have these spaces where your eyes are meant to go. I'm seeing more and more and more of these in newer books. It seems to be a trend that's happening a lot in illustration. Um, I don't know if it's because of the popularity of graphic novels and comics, or if it's just um, sort of a trend in styles right now, but it is interesting to look and see how the story progresses, both through the written text at the top and then through those borders and boxes um, in the illustrations. And sometimes when you have borders and boxes, you get what is called breaking the frame. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, David Weezer's Three Pigs. Um, and so here's an example of um, the wolf huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in and the pig saying, hey, he blew me right out of the story. So the, the pig is coming through, he's breaking the frame. This is kind of like when you watch television and um, they break the fourth wall, right? I always use the example of Saved by the Bell. Um, you know, when Zach Morris would say "Time out," and everyone would freeze and he would look at the camera. But then I realized that my students are too young to get that reference or I'm too old to use it. So I have to find something new. All right, so now I want you to look at the illustrations. So page through your book. I know you're already kind of digging in and looking, but paging through, um, there's so many different styles and so many types of media. So you have things that are really realistic. You have things that are a little bit cartoonier, things that are meant to imitate a child's um, style of drawing. And then sometimes you just have the good fortune to come across an illustration like this that's just stunningly beautiful. So the nice thing about illustrations that's really kind of interesting is that the illustrator has to act like a photographer sometimes, right? Because they're limited by the, the size and the shape of the book. So how does the, um, you know, how does the illustrator act like a photographer to, to deal with the limit? So here's an example of some perspective where we have stuff up at the front and then it's going all the way back and stretching. And so you're getting this feel that you have these, um, these hills or these mountains in the very back and then you've got tents and then there are people up close. Um, this illustrator is Chris Soon Pete and he is a genius at this. And then here's another example from a book called Karate Hour. This one gives me the heebie-jeebies a little bit. I don't really like feet, <laughs> but I think it does such a great job of showing how the illustrator is dealing with the limitations of the rectangle. So by cutting off the shoulders and head of the adult in the background, we're, we focus on the foreground, the foot in the foreground, um, and it acts more like a photograph that way. All right, so let's talk about conventions. So convention just means the things that people sort of have agreed upon and they use consistently across different media. So for example, um, a convention for movement um, might be having the same character in a lot of different ways and you can kind of see the progression. So that's the, the example on the left. Here on the right, we've got sort of these blurry lines, right? Or, or people's faces look a little bit smudged um, to, to indicate that they're moving very quickly. Dreaming or thinking, you know, we get these little cloud bubbles um, or, you know, the clouds coming up from the head. Something that when we see it, we know what that means, right? It's a convention. 
past and present, oftentimes illustrators will use different, um, different tones or different coloring. So in this example, you know, I've got the brighter, richer colors in the present. And then when the characters are going back into the past, we have these sepia tones. There's a border there or a box that demonstrates that this is something different. Differing realities, we also have these conventions of like, you know, the, the character is there or the figure is there, but not quite there. And so what's going on? Is she a ghost? Is she a memory? Is she really there by some kind of magic? And so we know that that's, um, you know, not reality as we know it. And then finally, the last thing um, is the back matter. So the back matter is after you get through all of the story, all of the content of the book, and you get a lot of extra information. So this um, is a timeline of the uh, life of the artist that this book was about, and it includes all kinds of photos, um, really interesting information. And so this is a supplement to what's on the inside of the text, but oftentimes it really elevates the story. Um, there has been more than one occasion when I've read a text and I thought, eh, it's okay, I'm kind of underwhelmed. And then I read the back matter and it's so fascinating and it just completely changes the way that I read the text. So it's important not to skip over that stuff. Um, and oftentimes you can learn things. So if, um, if the book is about um, a tradition or a culture or a celebration or something that isn't familiar to you, then you get a little bit of information about it. Um, or you know, someone's customs or the way that people think about things. And so it's, it helps contextualize the story. Um, and then it also just teaches you new things, which is really nice. Um, and these I have found are often a springboard for inquiries with kids because once they know that something is out there, they wanna ask lots of questions about it. And of course they need to get those questions answered. Okay, so what I want you to think about is what have you learned from examining books in this way? What does this indicate about selecting high quality books for children? And how might lingering in a book in this way change your students' reading experiences? So I don't know if people wanna kind of ch chime in in the chat, um, but these are questions that I would like for you to kind of walk away with tonight. Um, maybe ponder as you're going about your evening um, because it really does make a difference. Um, and I always tell my students, you know, it's not that you have to spend 45 minutes looking at every single book, right? We're busy, we have things to do. But once we go through one and we share this with kids, then they can kind of start looking for these things on their own. And it really helps them engage. It helps some of them find a new entry point into the books. Um, and it just gets them invested in different ways. And it, it's different, um, different ways of making meaning when they're exploring texts. So questions, comments, book recommendations. Laura, maybe you wanna come back and we can do some Q and A. Absolutely. Christy, this is fantastic. I'm just, yeah. um, I'm blown away. I work mostly with um, elementary education um, uh, majors, undergraduates, and I've already got some plans for what I'm going to be doing with them tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> we have a few questions in the chat. Um, one of them I'm going to start with, I actually responded to this one uh, to her already, but somebody just wanted to know if they do go in and find your page in Goodreads, are you okay with them sharing that? Sure. Yeah, great. Yeah, okay. Awesome. All right, we have a few other um, questions. Um, so one of the ones is maybe while I'm asking this question, someone wanted to see the three questions on the previous slide. Oh, so yeah. back, back a slide, that would be nice. great. Um, so these are some fantastic questions. So somebody asked when conducting a book study with young children, like maybe say K through first grade, how do you keep young children engaged when you are lingering, right? Do you point out these details with them? Do you have discussions and read the story all at once? Or do you tend to have several different, you know, lessons or sessions yeah. with one text? Yeah. So um, when I taught kindergarten, um, I had the first year I taught kindergarten, I just had a group that loved books. And so my job was 
easy and joyful because they just wanted to read all the time. And so um, I always tried to help them understand that real people make these books. And so often I would show them a picture of authors and illustrators. And then I would say, um, when I finished reading aloud, we would always clap. And that wasn't for me, but that was to show our appreciation to the author and illustrator to, you know, say, hey, real people made these, <laughs> made these texts. Um, and so as we were doing that um, and spending a lot of time and thinking about that, one of the things that they started to notice was the, um, the, the emblem or like the logo of the publishing house. And then they started to notice, oh, well, Green Willow Press is where all the Kevin Hinkie's books come from. We always can tell that it's going to be Green Willow Press when it says Kevin Hinkie's. And I was like, okay, we got to, we got to investigate this. So that's when I started really, um, pointing things out when I started learning more myself so that I could, you know, support them in their questions. Um, but I do tend, I did always tend to just kind of read the first time, like, let's just read it aesthetically, enjoy it, you know, enjoy the joy of the story. And then we would go through and we would um, look at things a little more closely. And I would always pose questions like, why? why do you think that it's this way instead of another way? And if you were the author or the illustrator, how would you do it? And so then we ended up just choosing authors that we wanted to study. And then we would do, we would make books in the style of those authors. Um, it was a private kindergarten. Like I, I had a lot of liberty to do whatever I wanted. <laughs> um, and so, um, so it was really great, but I think it's also very doable in public spaces too. Um, and you know, if you see that kids are getting restless, it's time to move on and you can pick it up the next day. Um, I'm all about lingering over days because you know, they do get a little squirrely sometimes if you <laughs> spend a lot of time. And someone actually did mention in the chat that that they that they feel like this lingering could really affect how children do create their own books. So using these as mentor texts for yeah, writing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and seeing, you know, what they do with end pages and asking, you know, like, well, why did you do this? You know, it's is it related? Is it part of the story? You know, they had all of these decisions to make. And so they were really getting a lot of practice and decision making. Um, and I would see that spill over into other parts of the day because um, they had so much practice doing it when we did this that they were confident to do it in other spaces. Yeah, absolutely. So another question here um, is, and this is a really interesting, sorry, my dogs just barged into the room. Um, <laughs> this, this is a really interesting question given the, um, increase in ebooks, as well as the amount of um, online teaching that many of us have been doing over the last year. So um, somebody asked with the increase of ebooks, how can you promote lingering? There's such this strong desire to swipe, you know, as, as children mm -hmm. learn these digital concepts about how yeah. print and text work, right? So how do you, how might you promote that in a digital context? So I, I tend to, um, I, I started this during the pandemic and then I've carried it over. So I tend to use ooh, Kindle. Okay. Amazon. We can talk about that some other time. Um, but I, I use Kindle um, when I read to my undergrads too, because I want them to be able to see it. Right. But I still point out because most of the time in a Kindle version, you're still going to get things like the cover page and then they'll show the end papers and then the title page. And so it's still, you still can do it for many of the features. Now, of course, things like paper, it's not really an, a possibility, but I think that, you know, if you have a digital text and you can get your hands on the hard copy, even if it's just from the library, you know, even if it's not something that you purchase to keep in your classroom, they're still gonna get something from that. And then the kind of the flip side of that is there are all these new ways to think about books, right? Because you can zoom in, the swiping, you know, tapping, there are all these different ways. And so um, it's it's not necessarily better or worse, it's just different. And so I think it's important for kids to have both. Someone just uh, posted in the chat that this, this lingering helps redefine the notion of what reading is. And um, it's sort of an antidote to this emphasis on just sounding out 
you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I think that's um, a really great thing to consider. Um, there's somebody, and I actually, um, I, I, I'm really eager to hear your response to this question too, because I work with emergent bilingual kids and somebody asked in the Q&A, if you have any specific book recommendations um, for emergent uh, bilingual readers. And I would also shout out to anybody who's um, attending who has some ideas to share for um, great text choices for emergent bilingual kids, you should you could pop those in the chat in addition to Christy responding. Yeah, so I think anytime you can get a bilingual text, right, if you can get a book that is, it has English and a different language in it, that's always, and, and that's an interesting text feature, right? Like that's something that you can also talk about. Like when you notice the text, what do you see? So, you know, we've got English and Spanish or we've got English and Mandarin or whatever it is, right? Um, so that's part of it. And then also, um, if you have books, like I always think of The Very Hungry Caterpillar because it's been, you know, published in like 40 languages or something. So if you have an English version as well as Spanish, Mandarin, whatever it is, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So looking across those texts as well, like what's different, what's the same? And the illustrated text, and yes, illustrations are a text that you read, right? The illustrated text is gonna be pretty consistent. And so then comparing those things across is really powerful. Um, and I also just think that really emphasizing to kids that you can read even if you're not reading the words because you're reading all of this other stuff, right? You're reading the illustrations, you're reading the, the end papers, you know, all of these things are just in service of making meaning. And so um, anything that you can just kind of emphasize helps them feel more confident and then they can tackle that printed text as well. You're, you're making me also think about texts where it, they're not just one language and another language, but there's actually some intermingling or yeah. meshing of the languages. Sure. I'm thinking about, um, oh, is it the guardian angel or, uh, oh shoot, what is it? The man in the silver mask, a bilingual cuento. Mm -hmm. oh. um, and so that's one example that I'm thinking of, and that's really fun. I've seen kids do their own meshing, you know, emergent bilingual kids. Of, of yeah, and Juju Morales um, does that a lot, um, and she was one of the, you know, dreamers was a um, is a really great example of that. Um, and so, yeah, there I think there's lots of entry points. You just have to read a lot. Oh darn! <laughs> so you know what's out there and available. And I'm thinking of another text that. Um, a picture book called Stepping Stones and it's a refugee's journey and it's written bilingually in Arabic and English, but the illustrations are all different stones like yep. that create little people and things. So, and we've also got some people sharing some texts. And oh, like, good, good. That. So that's awesome. Perfect. Um, Oh, I am not seeing any further questions here. Um, what I think I'm going to do, we can, we can stay on if others do pop up, but I think what I'd like to do is if there are people who are, um, you know, trying, uh, maybe currently typing a question and you don't want to quite sign off yet, that's fine. But um, I'm guessing there are also people who are who need to go and that's fine too. Um, Dr. Angleton, I really want to thank you and I want to thank all of uh, the participants and attendees for joining us today. We're very interested in your feedback um, about um, this session as well as your ideas for future webinars. Um, tomorrow, you're going to be receiving a follow-up email that's going to include a link to a short survey. Um, and if you're interested in receiving a professional development PD hour for your attendance, you'll find a link that has like an evidence of completion form at the end of the survey. And then by early next week, a recording of this webinar will be available on the Redbird Educator Series website. Um, we're also hosting another webinar this fall. Uh, on Wednesday, November 3rd at 4 p.m., we will feature Dr. Grace Kang and Dr. Sonia Klein, also from the School of Teaching and Learning, in their webinar titled Towards a Critical Approach, a Tool to Analyze and Transform Writing Pedagogy. And so you'll be able to find a description of that webinar and register to attend on our website. So for those of you who need to jump off, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Take care and we hope to see you again.
Um, with that, if there are people who do want to linger with us and have additional questions, um, you are welcome to um, add those into the chat um, or into the Q&A feature. Um, I'm not seeing any um, additional questions right now, but Christy, there's somebody made a comment here that I thought was so interesting with regard to um, teaching nonfiction texts and other kinds of features like an index and, and things like that. And then someone also said something about um, in digital text, they don't have indices because you click on a word, right? And that's a whole other feature, right? Of, and like hyperlinks. Yeah, yeah. I Listen, I'm, <laughs> I'm not really a digital reader. So <laughs> people will probably know more about that than I do. Um, but yeah, I think, um, I so I, I, I love peritext, right? So peritext is anything extra that's not the, the book proper, you know, the stuff. So all of the stuff that we talked about, um, most of it, I guess, could be considered peritext. And so for things like nonfiction texts, it's really, um, it's just so rich usually, right? Because it's all this extra information that couldn't really fit in. Um, and so it's almost like a bonus book, really. Um, and kids, yeah, for real. <laughs> and kids love them, right? Like, because they just, once we know, um, once we know and we can show them and share that with them, then, then they attend to it. And so then, the, then it's a new resource for them. Yeah. yeah. We do have another question here. And this is another one of those questions that you can probably answer, Christy, but um, there may be people who are um, some of the other attendees who have a response as well. And somebody asked, do you know of a resource where teachers could apply for book donations? I'm a newer teacher and trying to build up my library. Mm -hmm. So I know donors choose is something that a lot of people um, use. And the great thing about donors choose is sometimes, um, usually like you can put in a book list and people can buy specific titles or they can just donate money. And oftentimes they'll do like matching. So if you, if you donate $50, we'll match it. So the teacher gets a hundred bucks. So that's really great. Um, a lot of people will just make wish lists on Amazon and make them public and, you know, put them on Facebook and ask their friends and families. Um, and then, you know, make friends with the teachers who are going to retire in the next year or two, because when they retire, you can adopt their library. So there's lots of ways to go about doing it for sure. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you. Well, I don't see any other questions. This has been such a wonderful um, webinar and, and I, I'm just really um, engaged and, and um, energized, Christy. And I, and I can tell from the chat that other people are. Somebody also mentioned, by the way, in the chat to look at the Dollar General Literacy Grant as yeah. well. So you can look for others like small grants like that mm -hmm. that you can, you can apply for, so anyway. I think that um, we're going to um, sign off. Thank you once again, Christy Angleton, for sharing your expertise with Absolutely. us. Thank, fun. thank you all for attending. <laughs>